I'm Russell Carpenter, and you're listening to the Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft, and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Ilya. Hey, Ben. Guess what number we're at? I know what number we're at. I know you just told me, actually. It's 40. The big 4 0, man. 4 0. 40, 40 interviews, 40, uh, 40 featured guests. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah, we haven't repeated one yet. No, no, but uh, but I'd, I'd really like to. I'd actually like to get a couple of people back here. There's some people who, uh, there. I'm I'm not gonna like go into way way too much detail, but Rodney Charters. I'd Rodney like to Charters. Bring, I'd like yeah. to bring Rodney Charters. Back. Oh my God, we we need to clear out like we need to clear out like all day for Rodney. You know, it'd be fun bring back Jason Wingrove, guest number one, because I just feel like we get how to do this better. Like we could get some of our early guests back in and and redo them. I'd love to have Chris Coleman back. I'd love yeah. to have some people back. Fraser Bradshaw has had uh, like a whole Abe Martinez. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Abe Martinez is uh, shooting Queen of the South now, yeah, which yeah. my friend Ed Sanchez is one of the directors on. Oh, right on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, we, we should probably do some like, uh, where are they now? Because, you know, uh, when we started this five years ago, uh, a lot of stuff's happened. A lot of hey, people have. Yeah. Hey, why don't we throw this to the listeners? Hey, listeners, who do you want to hear more from? Ooh. Screw us. We, I know who I like to hang out with, but, you know, this isn't about me. This is about you. Uh, I can tell you right now that Johnny Durango is typing furiously, Johnny Durango, Johnny Durango. <laughs> over no. and over and over again. <laughs> which, which I think was only, a, a, I mean, it was within the last 12 months. So. And Charles Pappert is probably at least <laughs> going to say something on Facebook. Yeah. It, it, well, no, may, maybe not. Charles has not heckled us. Like, you know, and, and it, he heckles us with love. But, yeah, you know, no, he, with love. And I, I receive his tackles with love he's yeah he's, uh, I, I i do appreciate he's it he's a, so, a sprightly and wonderful presence in my life i love when former guests uh send us messages that's, that's true that, that's a lot of fun no uh, no it's great yeah i actually oh and speaking of which oh, though, i have to give a shout out to jake today one of our listeners today came by hot rod cameras and claimed his free t-shirt so remember so, that any so Ilya, you're proving my point that if i troll you in these host wraps yeah that, that I, I can actually make you part with uh with swag. apparel yeah. <laughs> people can like stop buying clothes and they can come to you it and get a hot rod t-shirt just for walking in the door and mentioning that you want your your damn t-shirt while supplies last sizes are subject to availability i know we've got a few uh very large ones 2x 3x that uh you know got someone's name on it we have to give them away come on out come on out to hot rod cameras and ask for Ilya and ask for your damn t-shirt yeah we'll, we'll take care of it and thank you jake yeah i i actually got a shout out from uh larry fong Woo! and larry fong had listened to the uh newton thomas siegel uh, episode and uh and had thoroughly enjoyed it and it was like yeah, like getting a text from Larry Fong is is a gift every time. He he sent you a text message. Nice. Yeah, he texted me directly. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, I think Manuel Billiter also, or maybe it was his agency, but someone uh, reposted his episode thirty nine just recently, and then we got another whole like wave of people who uh, who who listened to the show, which was wonderful. So our listeners get it. We 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 love our own show, and we're and we think we're great. So uh, uh, yeah, but you know, please help us, help us spread the word. If you love this show too, you. Please put it out there because uh, this is actually how we get to do more fun stuff, how we get to give away more shirts, do more live episodes, you know, uh, tr- uh, increase our frequency. We're already increasing quite a bit, but I- I'd like to get it up even more. Yes. You would like to get it up even more. Ooh, that's what she said. So, uh, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> this is why it says explicit on yes, next to the right there, yeah. podcast. That, cheap that, that, cheap boner jokes. Cheap shots. Boners. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, no, no, so don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know how to elegantly segue from that. There, there, to, is, there is no elegant segue. So, so our guest <laughs> is an amazing guest. This, this episode is one of the, one of the people who we were most excited. I mean, we're excited for everyone to come on. We are, but Holy mother of God, I could not believe that Russell Carpenter sat down in the chair that I'm currently sitting in. And if you don't know who Russell Carpenter is right now, shame on you. You need to like immediately go to IMDb and just take a look at his filmography from like 1978 until present day. It is uh, stunning tons of stuff that you have seen you have loved yes if you if you like movies you have seen a lot of russell carpenter's work you have and in fact he uh he, he shot uh, i think for the longest time the highest grossing movie of all time titanic that's right titanic so I'll, that that's a nice starting off point but go check out russell carpenter and here is our interview with russell carpenter <laughs> the cinematography podcast interview 
Russell Carpenter, we cannot be more happy to have you here in uh, lovely downtown Burbank at the uh, Cinematography Podcast. Thanks so much for coming out. Thank you so much. So my first stock question that I ask everybody, and it's it's to kind of kick off the conversation of craft and philosophy, which is really our, our main thing, is I have a belief that when a DP is reading a script, they are either imagining compositions as they're going and imagining like almost like a comic book in their head, or they're imagining the way they're going to light scenes and the way that scenes are going to feel light-wise, and then they find compositions in there later. When you're reading a script, what, are, what first occurs to you as, a, as an artist? Usually the first thing I, I go for when I read a script is that, that is it something that I want to do? <laughs> and is it, is it something that I think I could do a good job, that I think I could really contribute to the production and, and uh, uh, help the director out, whoever he or, or she is? Mm-hmm. And then as I go through, I may start to form images, but I, I don't really so much. I try to just feel if I'm connecting with the material. And then something may come up later where I start to feel like uh, strongly that that I have a good sense of where the the visual flavor of the film, and I know, and that usually gets confirmed if I if I have a good meeting with a director. Yeah. Sometimes though, uh, I read a film, and it's completely opaque to me. Really? You know, I got I got nothing. You know. Mm-hmm. And then when I go to the interview, I'm usually asking the the director a lot of questions so like when a movie when you're saying a script is opaque to you are you talking about a movie like something that's going to get made by the studios like a regular old movie like we're not talking about yeah. about like uh i don't mean this in a, in a negative way we're not talking about like a terrence Malick completely abstracted art film like well, w- what would make it opaque to you is it just that it's not reaching you well or? yeah sometimes it's not reaching me but the the other issue here and, and i think we're right away we're going to plunge into kind of the state of the business I think the more opaque movies are the ones that are outside of the purview of what we consider Hollywood mainstream. Because mm-hmm. unfortunately, what we do see is that basically the reason that studios exist now is 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 not to make brilliant movies. Though I think that they're making great movies in, mm-hmm. in, in some people at Pixar Studios. But basically, because now studios are usually line items in a much bigger corporation's uh, <laughs> box of toys... Yeah. And they have a, a duty to their stockholders to return, uh, make a return. And so basically what we're doing is we're piling movies into big clumps of, uh, you know, sandcastles that are supposed to make money. Yeah. And yeah. they don't really look that individual from the next sandcastle. So therefore, it's actually very easy to, for, for maybe somebody who's becoming involved in it to go, oh, it's a romantic movie. I know what the people are supposed to look like. I know what the demands of the studio are going to be. I've got some sense of how far I can go one way or the other with the lighting. It's an action movie. I've got a big, you know, and, yeah. and yes, you go, sometimes your marching orders are right there on the page. And, uh, you know, you and unfortunately, you may be looking at something that looks pretty much like the last big thing that came out last yeah. year. And, and <laughs> somebody said, I, I don't know the person who said that, that, that for, unfortunately, Hollywood is a town where people are always running to where lightning just struck. You know? <laughs> so and, true. And, that's, and usually when lightning strikes, it's not usually sponsored by a studio unless it's picked up by a studio yeah. from somebody who who poured their guts into a film that shows up at Sundance or one of the other festivals. That's it's true, but like, do people uh, like who are making Sundance kind of movies? Do you get approached by those kinds of people very often, or because uh, you're so known as a studio? Uh, yeah, cinematographer. I think that's a uh, yeah, that that's a problem. I I uh, I did a, a film. Gosh, now it's over two years ago in India for not much money at all, mm-hmm. and it was uh, it was such a great experience, just working way outside of my wheelhouse, but I had a great time. And uh, it, it was a movie about how women in the outskirts of the of the cities in India are treated. You know, the the many many levels of misogyny, uh, mm-hmm. of, of religious bias and caste bias play into uh, making it a really hard go for uh, women, especially in small villages. And uh, it was a blissful experience. And I wish I had more opportunity to do that, but I. I do, I, I 
<laughs> you know, I, I think at one point I really tried to work outside of the Hollywood uh, motion picture system. And uh, but I had a knack for picking independent films where where I somehow became the kiss of death. If I liked the film, nobody was going to see it. Eventually. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a talent. What can I say? So, uh, what's the name of the movie that you shot? In oh, India? Uh, it's called Parched. P A R C H E D. And is it something that uh, can be you, found over? Yes, here? you can. You can find it probably on iTunes and and other places. Yeah. So when somebody who's, I mean, I, I sort of feel like as, as the cinematographer of one of the most uh, highest grossing movies of all time, I, one of the most iconic mm-hmm. movies, Titanic, I feel like as an independent, uh, an independent filmmaker might be um, a little intimidated to even reach out to you. How, do, how would those people reach out to, to you? Because to me, you're, you're like way up there. You're, well, you're, yeah, I, I, should, I should be buying billboards or something. <laughs> Hire Russell Carpenter. Yeah, yeah no, next, next to the 101 somewhere. <laughs> and, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and right now I'm, I'm still, uh, for another few years, kind of going to be in that Hollywood type of film. But yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, I'll just put the hopeless uh, ads and uh, <laughs> the scratch things in, over at Sundance or something like that. Well, this is something that I, I feel like I ask everybody who who works on like the big, you know, mm-hmm. above hundred million dollar yeah. budgets is what what's it like? And a few of them have, and I'm not saying this for your benefit necessarily. They said it's like turning the Titanic around. Sometimes yeah, it's yeah. like you make a decision in February, and then the following September you have to execute that idea. How do you keep the creative spark alive when you're working on uh, on a film that's like so big and so many decisions have to be made so far out? And and also, how much of your job becomes management when you're working on a film of yeah, that scope? Well, uh, yeah, for for those of you who are starting out, I have to tell you, you know, that the artist in you, it's not that the artist is going to be crushed because that's not true. <laughs> we, we, that's that's the part of you that's going to keep you alive. But you're also going to have to find out how to be a manager and a politician and a scientist. If, if that's not in your wheelhouse, you have to you have to know enough. And uh, uh, so you have to keep all four of those plates spinning at the same time. And also you have to do it on, on a schedule. If you think that things are chaos, you know, on the, on the small film, you were chaos on the small film that you just did and everybody was just starting out, that, that chaos never really stops. And it just gets, uh, it, it, it just goes to different levels. And, and that some of the problems of never be having enough time, that's, that's going to dog you throughout your career. No, no, uh, don't, uh, yeah, don't say it. Yeah, because you always, uh, yeah. But the, the, the issue with the bigger <laughs> films is, and especially if you're doing something that's complex, even though the uh, plot lines may not be complex, just the logistics of doing action films are very complex. And you have to be able to make sure that the communication is flowing through so many different departments. And if you have an idea, you have to tell people, sometimes months ahead of time, that you're going to need a such and such crane or such and such lens. Uh, because it's not something that you can just, that creative idea can't just pop into your head on the day. They're complex. And I think obviously there's, depending on the director you're working with, and uh, there's a lot of room for creativity. And uh, the, the issue though, is that on the big films, you know, it's just this horrible feeling of, yeah, you wanna do a big job, but eventually, Somebody from the marketing department is going to come along and tell you, "Wow, you, you you've given us really good product here," and your and then your 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 whole inner soul artist person is just going to cave and mm. and 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 crumble. I I don't know. I mean, to me, even though as things get a lot get going and they're they're more uh, logistically challenging, and you, and there's a challenge in that, but you can still. I mean, uh, go go along and and still find a way if the studio and the director are supportive to really bring your creative uh, aspect to the foreground. And there are some films that you just you, you get a vibe from the production company because I think the production company and the people who are there, who are producing and the line producers and and everybody who I thought was were oh they're just bean counters when I started out and I was in my my twenties. 
I realize that those people are just as creative and they're making just as creative an input on the film, depending on how they allocate money Mm -hmm. uh, that determines, you know, how you use your time and what tools you have at your at your discretion. So I I have really become, uh, you know, starting out, I, I, I don't know, I didn't have there were a lot of people I I thought, well, they're not the movie makers, and yet they are. And you realize that a producer may have spent 10 to 15 years trying to get this project in front of the camera. For sure. And had, had, had come this close so many times and had you know the ability to make that film just whisked away because of somebody's schedule, an actor's schedule or something like that. So now I, I just, I, I think everybody, I just have so much uh, respect for what everybody does. And it, it just took me a while to come around to that. You know? <laughs> I, starting out, it was like, well, I was so influenced by some of the imagery that I saw, and I wanted to make that imagery, and I was so focused on that. I had, it took me years to learn that you also have to make that set. At a certain time, you have to give that set to the actor or actress and make that a sacred space for them where they feel totally supported and where they feel that they're gonna do their very best work. And uh, uh, sometimes that means that, oh, you realize that there's a little something wrong with that magnificent lighting that you did and you wanna just spring out and change it, but you, you have to learn that there are other ways to, to do that without breaking the flow of mm. uh, the creative process. So um, you told me you, you never went to film school, correct? I didn't, but I, I did have a film school in that I, I went down to San Diego State thinking that because I, I couldn't afford to go to UCLA. I couldn't mm-hmm. afford to go to U. U- and you're from Van Nuys, California, yeah, correct? Well, yeah that's, yeah, that's where I grew yeah. up. I was in Orange County. I was down behind the dark iron curtain of Orange County conservatism <laughs> in the 1970s. and. Uh-huh. And then you busted out into freewheeling Van Nuys. Oh yeah, freewheeling Van Nuys, and uh, yeah. that's where I live now. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then I spent some time in Venice, California, which, nice. which totally changed my world point of view. Uh, but uh, let's see, where where was? Oh, I well, I couldn't afford to go to these places, and, and so were. You, uh, but were you trying to go to film school? I, I I didn't know what I wanted to do, really. I, I but I thought it was probably in television or something like that. And my AV teacher, uh, the last thing he told me before he disappeared into the inner realms of Hawaii, and he was t- telling me he was going there to grow tomatoes, but I have a feeling the crop was slightly different. And uh, <laughs> It was asparagus. Yeah, it was as- yeah exactly. Broccoli. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, but he, he, he had gone to San Diego State, and he, he said I should go down there, and he introduced me, uh, some friends of mine, he introduced us all to the campus, and so uh, I, I t- did one quarter in the television department. I said, this isn't quite right for me. And I became an English major. Mm. <laughs> and, and for the rest of it, you know, I, I, and now I've never read a novel in like 20 years. But, <laughs> there have been some good ones. But it, was, it taught me about story structure. And then uh, in, I still had to earn some money to get through school. So I did go to work for the public broadcasting station and first mm-hmm. worked as a, like this, this podium cameraman, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, but eventually got a, got a job in the film department. And boy, I, I just learned so much by uh, doing these little films. And, and, I, and you pretty much, you're in an environment because there's hardly any money at the station where whatever you do is going to wind up on the air somehow, some way. And, <laughs> and I mean, it's just, I just, one, you know, it felt like at least the failures weren't seen by many people. But I, I did learn something about exposing film and, and camera work that way. But it wasn't until uh, I was at another public television station and there was a director there when we were doing educational films, but he decided that he would, he would kind of... Uh, manipulate somebody with a lot of money into giving him enough money to make a, a really super low budget horror film that we basically shot in backyards and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, when that film was released for you know just a couple of weeks in a couple of theaters I just thought oh I had so hit the big time and, then, <laughs> and that's that's when I moved into the LA area and proceeded to starve for a few, few yeah. years because uh, the 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 shocking awakening was that there were a lot of people who wanted to do the same thing 
and they had much better footage to show than I did. So it was a long time of just uh, doing whatever I could, educationals, uh, corporates, uh, things like that. And, uh, uh, and then eventually people who were working on documentaries or in public broadcasting came up to L.A. and, and got me into uh, interviews on low-budget features. Well, you shot a low-budget feature that I have to say was a huge influence on me early on, and it's called The Wizard of Speed and Time. Oh, yeah. And I was actually, when I was when I was kind of, you know, look, I mean, like, again, like, I feel like I know your filmography, because yeah, yeah. since I was a teenager, I would look at a movie poster, and I, I would look at the stars, the oh, director, right. and then, like, for the cinematographer. I always wanted to see who that was. But I had I didn't remember that you had, because I saw that on, like, VHS tape yes. in, like, 1991 or something yeah. like that. But that was, like... Uh, so you did that that was like early 80s right yeah yeah it was around 1984 1983 1984 and it's one of your it's one of the first features that you dp one of the very first things that i i I got to do and it was uh for people who don't know mike jitlove he is a a one-of-a-kind person very much outside the realm of consider commercial is he still around? I, I don't know, but he he was doing these amazing films, which he was basically doing stop motion with humans. And uh, and usually this featured himself, and he would, it was this amazing live action animation in which he would sing songs one frame at a time, <laughs> you know, basically. Uh. And then when it was all put together, it would make sense, you know. I, and. I mean, he really existed in his own world, and he was just a treasure of a of a filmmaker. And like ordinarily, like films about the film business kind of rub me the wrong way, and I usually steer away from them. But for some reason, that movie is endearing because it's the nerdiness about the craft. Yes, like it's a movie about the craft of being kind of a weird outsider artist in the film business. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> but, but but it also it's it's so innocent in yeah. take. and what's brimming in it is the the joy of just doing these goofy little movies yeah, yeah. Know, which which i grew up on just doing little eight millimeter movies and they were totally stupid but we just loved it and this mm-hmm. is just somebody who kind of took that and then did something really amazing with it so how did you uh, end up working on that particular film so you'd been doing industrials and commercials and stuff yeah, like that yeah i think uh, that was daryl cass who was a uh, who who became a producer he did he's done a lot of work with happy madison but he would occasionally put me in front of somebody and mm-hmm. uh, and i was doing literally nothing you know i mean i just accept these so <laughs> far off i mean i felt like i was just so far away from my my goal yeah. of and he introduced me to to Mike, and I and that's that's how we did that. Yeah, I mean, it's just a movie about movie magic, and I feel like yeah. you know, it's it, it's just a bright a bright spot on any filmography. I think to see oh, to see something yeah. like that. Yeah. And I don't know I don't know how many people ask you about that movie, but like I, truly, it re- I was getting ready to go to film school when I saw that, <laughs> yeah. and it and it influenced me a lot. Although I never did any. The technique is called pixelation, right? Where he'd have like he'd jump in the air and take a, a frame. yeah he, he'd jump in the air and take a picture with it. He'd pull his legs up, take yeah. a picture. Jump in the air, pull his legs up, and his friend would take a picture. And then he moves slightly forward or make a right turn yeah. or a left turn. And but the but when you see it, it looks like he's flying around the it's room. It's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's just weird. Yeah. Yeah. It was that was that was lovely. And and then from that, I got a chance to do a little film in upstate New York called uh, Lady in White. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, not a budget, but amazingly released. You know, and, and you know, I was, I went. A friend took me to uh, see Alan Davia, who was shooting a uh, commercial, and you know, Alan Davia was <laughs> my god, and uh, pretty big deal. Yeah, and you know, we started. I got a chance to meet him and shake his hand. He says, "Hey, I, I, I haven't seen Lady in White, but people, people tell me it looks quite good." <laughs> and I lived on that. I think for about five years. You know? <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I know. It got me past the times when uh, the reviews would come out, and they would men- the reviews would mention the photography as dull and murky, and uh, you know, I just feel like I've just been stabbed through the neck. Oh for man! That. Yeah, yeah. But you just have to learn those ups and downs. You when you start to work within some in the realm where things are going to be reviewed that not everybody is going to love what you were doing. Of course. And, and you just, it just took me forever to learn not, again, not to crumble when that happened or even crumble going into a, uh, 
uh, an interview and, and somebody picks somebody else. In fact, I just kept working. I think it's really a good idea to just try and get out to as many interviews as you can. Oh, because for sure. It's all good practice. Well, and, and I think the people in, in this business, like we always hear about like actors who do, you know, dozens of auditions or whatever, you know, they, yeah. a, a, an actor who works a bunch might book 10% of what they audition for. But people outside of the acting profession, like cinematographers and directors and whatnot, like they might not get but one meeting every few weeks if they're yeah. lucky even. Yeah, if know? they're lucky. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, so, it was, uh... so it's like, it's a little more crushing when you, when you don't get it. I've always felt when it, when it comes to the reviews, I've always felt that if I ever taught at a film school, which I'm not necessarily right recommending anyone ask me to do. Uh, I think that you sh- it would be good if you if, if there was a way to teach people how to take negative criticism, not not like well-written critique, but criticism, like have the whole class like say to them, OK, so now I want everyone to tell, uh, you know, Bobby, everything you hated about his film, hated, you know, and just yeah. just to like build up that scar tissue, because, yeah. you know, when you're doing stuff that's so public, people are watching your movie. And, and you know, I feel like it's I mean, like, I guess if it's fair to praise the cinematography, it's also fair to criticize it. But also, you know, you're even in the early days, one of the first movies I think I ever saw that you shot was Cameron's Closet. Because I'm a I'm a I'm a Fangoria guy. I'm a kid who was obsessed with horror movies. And Cameron's Closet got written up in Fangoria. And I'm like, I I think I tracked it out on VHS because it didn't play. I'm from. Well, yeah, I I really thought I had. bought up every every negative of that film that ever <laughs> it came on the heels i had done uh the film that uh, alan davio liked lady in white correct uh, on the heels of that the production manager said I, i'd love you for you to do this film called the camera's closet i went from that and got my clock cleaned oh on, no oh on on camera's closet because i didn't know it it just I don't think I had the skill set to work as fast as they wanted to work. And also, our crew was not, you know, we're all we're all learning at the same time. And, and as you go along, the people you work with get more seasoned. And we were all kind of thrown into this thing. And I just looked, I don't think I've looked at it in. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, whatever, since it was made. Now, you know, and there are a few feel, films that I feel about that. You just... You just try and learn and just go on to the next thing and just go on to the next well, thing. Well, so we'll talk more about Lady in White then because it seems yeah. like that was a real, uh, yeah. that was the thing that kind of got you going in the direction that, yeah. you, that you kept going in. Yeah, it was at the time, it was the first time then the director, you, uh, there was support from the director, Frank Lelogia, f- to get a certain kind of look. And I mean, we were kind of working for very, very, very little, which meant that actually that we didn't have to hurry up. Like how many days were you shooting for? Uh, you know, I I can't remember, mm-hmm. but it was probably actually now I think it probably wasn't that long. It, it'd be a miracle if it was thirty five days long. But, <laughs> but you know, he, the director, he had a, a certain idea for the look, and he and so it wasn't just just go ahead and do it. It was let's let's make this, and uh, because I had infinite amounts of time off between things, you know, the, the working thing, I. Uh, I would just go and at the time I was watching Betamax because it was the infinitely better. <laughs> so much better. <laughs> so much better. I remember the Betamax snobs. <laughs> yeah. I had a roommate who was a big v- Betamax snob. V- VHS. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Uh, so I brought my Betamax machine and mm-hmm. whatever came. But I would watch films backward and forward and backward and forward. And, and somebody told me about Vittorio Storaro and I went to see his work and it, it just blew me away i said who lights like that and then of course uh the the american cinematographers like at the time haskell wexler mm-hmm. and uh connie hall and owen roisman but i just i had so much time just to so i would just play the films backward and forward and backward and what forward. do you what do you learn from them backward well what uh i mean i would go back oh you just what, watch what them over you, and over again. yeah what and or stop and look at frames and I, I i would start to pull the the frame apart and go well why is he lighting from over here why is he doing this i looked at uh vittoria Stara's work I, I saw the conformist and uh, no it wasn't the well i saw the conformist but it was last tango in paris and i I said okay this scene the, the room's lit by this they walk out of the room and they come back and it's supposed to be just like five minutes later, so the light wouldn't change that much. But something had changed. And so if you're going really slow and you look at it, you go, well, why is this here? Why is this here? And then as you see the pl- scene play out, you say, oh, the cinematographer, Vittorio Straro, he's made these little adjustments 
for where the scene goes. He, he's basically kept it so if you weren't looking at the film, you wouldn't really notice a major change in the lighting. Yeah. But if, you, if you're you know, nerdy enough to play it backward and forward, then you're, you go, oh, I see what he's doing. And that, that's how I was, I was learning. I, I was also on the weekend sneaking in to uh, see uh, uh, AFI at that time. They had cinematographers come like one Saturday every month and they'd show their films and they'd talk about the lighting. And I was just like, mind, it was mind blowing to go in and, and, you know, I would sneak, you know, sit in the back because I wasn't in the classes. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Caleb Deschanel would come and talk about uh, the Black Stallion, or he would come and talk about uh, the Natural. You know, many years later, and mm-hmm. you're just, uh, you know, the, the the plus side of that is uh, it's demoralizing to see somebody who's who's, I mean, at that time that young doing the work of a master. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, uh, because you're. You know, and I'm thinking, oh, I, I am just going to be on the bunny slopes of cinematography for the rest of my life. You know, it's not going to happen. But, uh, but then also you're learning a lot, you know. And, and now I'm just amazed at how much material is up in the air, uh, up on, on the, well, let's call it the Internet air on YouTube or Vimeo <laughs> that shows what people did behind the scenes. I mean, it, Oh, yeah, it, you can find so much. Tremendous. You know, so that's, that's different. So we, we kind of glossed over this, but, you know, your your forensic level interest in like how they're putting this stuff together. Where does that come from? Where does it start for you to be to be so interested in the in the visual image? Moment of truth. I think it comes from insecurity because I I had no idea how these people were achieving the the level of uh, drama. But even like what yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of saying, like, go back in, into your history. When did it even start? When, when did the interest in cinematography start for you? Like, where does that come from? Uh, well, m- maybe it comes from where anybody else starts, just just goofing around as a mm. teenager. But I didn't really think that that's what I wanted to do. I, 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 somehow, uh, I somehow got led by suggestions to, oh, maybe go to this school. If you can't afford to go to this school, maybe you go to this school. And then I was very fortunate to get a job at, a, at public television. And then from there... I don't know, little suggestions sometimes mm-hmm. just come from the universe and say, uh, okay, bank So it was left. like a gradual thing that kind of Very led... Very gradual. Oh, my God. It was so... I mean, I, I, uh, I mean the, the, the film that I think people say, oh, well, that, that uh, really put you on the map. And it did, was, was True Lies. But I had been working for about going from low budget, I mean, no budget to low budget to fairly well bankrolled independent films mm-hmm. in a very, very gradual manner there yeah. was just nothing it, it's not like it's a a, a, a chivo lebeski skyrocket or a, <laughs> or a janusz kaminski skyrocket into oh my god where did these people come from uh well, I, I think in all cases they yeah. ended up working on one really high profile yeah. film that put them on the map but of course you had been around for a long time and even even something like it was just on cable last week i was watching uh lawnmower man oh yeah yeah and it's like lawnmower man uh, maybe doesn't hold up a, a thousand percent, no. but for its time, it was groundbreaking. Yes, it was. Boy, it was just the right right place and the right time because it 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 gave people at that time it gave people into the, the tiniest peak into into what would uh, computer generated yeah. images imagery would become. I mean, it was just and and that that time and there was a tremendous amount of interest in it, and and yet. You look at it and you go, wow, there's a, you know, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't hold up for sure. Yeah. Well, I think whenever you're doing something, it's like on the very, very cutting edge of whatever tech. Yeah. Um, nine times out of 10, you look back on it. I mean, it's not, it's not quite the same. And I know you didn't uh, shoot Terminator 2, but Terminator 2 was like a groundbreaking movie. And today you look at it and you go, well, I've seen, I've seen VFX that have gone further than that, but those VFX are perfect for that film and you wouldn't yeah. change any of them. Or Jurassic Park, you know, like th- there's a lot yeah. of those, and I think Titanic is definitely yeah. one of those where it pushed the edge of, of of what you could do with visual effects in ways nobody had ever imagined. And and now you look at it and you go, the film holds up. I think as a, as a, as a nice piece of pop culture, yeah, and and a, a really good action piece. But you look at where uh, CGI work has gone now, and you go, oh my god, yeah, that. that it, but it, I, it doesn't take 
anything away from what I think Jim Cameron dared to do with technology that wasn't quite up to where he wanted it to go. And he, he, he gave it a big kick in mm-hmm. that direction, like, like the ability to render water, oceans, and... and Oh yeah, yeah, and they had one of the very first face replacements in that movie, which which is kind of bone chilling to watch now. But oh, what is? I actually don't know about that. It is a uh, uh, in the last third of the movie, uh, Kate and Leo are being swept down a uh, corridor by a wave of water, tremendous wave of water, and and it wasn't safe for them to do. So what they did was the the the, the stunt doubles did it, and then. Later, Kate and uh, Leo's faces were put on their respective bodies. Mm-hmm. But especially, especially if you look at Kate, you know, you you really look at it. It's like now she's there. Now she's now it's a stunt person. Now it's Kate. <laughs> you know. It, but that I don't think that that shot went by. And when you're in the movie, like like yeah, Jim can put you in a movie. You, it, it just went by. But you know, now you just uh, then go. Oh, ouch. There you are, but okay. Uh, I- Ilya is about to in- interject a question. <laughs> so I saw Titanic opening weekend at the Chinese theater and completely did not notice the face replacement that you mentioned. I was totally swept up in the movie. It was a completely packed house, and uh, I-, I have really critical eyes, and that sort of thing always I always catch. It wasn't until I saw it the second time on DVD or something uh, that – when I saw it, I was like, wait a second, what was that? I had to go back and, and watch that exact shot like three times. And I was like, what am I seeing here? I, I didn't know what it was, but yeah, it was uh, yeah. the very first digital face replacement that I could ever recall where it was very clearly, it looked almost like a cardboard cutout in front of someone's face and it was kind of moving around and it was not in, in, yeah. in sync with everything. But still, uh, when I was in the big screen with that room full of people, it completely sold to me, and I know that I'm a really tough customer for that sort of thing. So I call that a success. And, and by today's standards, maybe it's old, but man, that I think 99.9 percent of the people didn't see a thing. Yeah, I think J- Jim is a master at knowing how long he can put something up on the screen, and where people will be emotionally, uh, their level of willing suspension of disbelief. Uh, he's so good at that. We uh, th- this is hopping into Titanic territory, but a lot of people don't realize that the iconic "I'm flying" scene yeah. with with Kate and Leo was actually most of that was shot indoors. Oh, really? And, yeah. And uh, how that came about was well, the the circumstances in which it was filmed was that uh, we needed a beautiful sunset, and yet where we were in, uh, in Baja California, Rosarito Beach, the weather was not cooperating at all. Every day, it seemed a f- massive fog bank would roll in, <laughs> oh. and the sun would just go behind it. And so, by the time he had anything that was supposed to look like sunset light, it was gone. So we were on the stern of the ship one day, and it looked like we were going to get a uh, a really nice sunset. So Jim said, "Okay, we're all going to the the front of the ship. We're going to see what we can get. It's just considered basically a." costume test or something like that but we're going to go for it so it was not easy to move stuff to the front of the ship because it was the top two decks were built even though the whole bottom was just a a big speed rail it was a big speed rail structure you had to unload stuff that would get kind of ferried to the front of the ship I, i i know it sounds insane but so big cranes would come in and pick up your small crane. I, I worked and, on a film once that was shot on a real battleship, and it was like that. You yeah, could, you yeah, just, no, you could it, just it, it was up and crazy. There was there was there was no way carved out to to say, okay, we're just going to take the dolly and reel it down. Mm-hmm. So by the time we got re- ready and the actors appeared, we were it was full court press because the 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 we were ki- almost started in the middle of the. Sun sunset. So we did as many takes as we could do. We did 11 of them and maybe seven of them were adequately in focus because every time Jim did a take, the next take would be different. He'd want something different. And the poor mm-hmm. focus puller who was like, uh, you know, 30 yards away because he, he couldn't get anywhere near the camera because it was up and on. The, uh, you know, he, he, he did what he could do, which was great work. And, and we, and by the, but 
actually what happened was we, we got those seven takes, the fog rolled in, I brought in some lights out there to, to mimic the effect of the sun had it been out, mm-hmm. and, and we got a few more takes. Uh, in some of those takes, though, you can basically see at the bottom of the frame waves crashing against the uh, uh, <laughs> uh, shore. I mean, we were that close to blowing <laughs> how we where the ship actually was. Uh, so uh, Jim looked at the footage the next day and he said, "He said, wow, this this I think this is really great. It's fantastic, but we don't have the scene." So uh, in a great leap of faith or, or knowledge, he and John Lando decided, and this is based on Jim's knowledge of of all kinds of techniques, that we would basically hire somebody to paint that sunset on a huge cyclorama, basically a hanging curtain in studio, and we would shoot the rest of the scene in studio. And so it was up to me to replicate something that I had shot under full panic, white hot panic. <laughs> and so I had to, you know, I had to kind of put the photography back together. And you know, you it's easy to scramble legs, like, harder to unscramble them. But, you know, <laughs> and so we, we kind of did the forensics on that. And we brought the wind machines in. And I find it very hard to tell what was shot on stage. And what was so it. it's so, a mix. So it's a totally mix. But there's more shots shot on stage than there were out on the day that we actually did the first part of the take. But then, and this is Jim knowing what can go how far. Basically, we were shooting our close-ups and I could throw the background out of focus and we were moving the camera up and down and the wind machines were going and we were doing all, employing all kinds of tricks. And I said, this is, this is looking good. I'm really happy with this. But then he says, I want to do a wide shot. Well, the background is like, 25 feet behind the actors. Yeah, that's about to And say. it looks like what it is. I'm looking at this and I'm going, those two actors are in front of a painted backdrop. I mean, I said, that's what it looks like to me. <laughs> and he brought it up to Jim and as he kind of batted down the suggestion. He said, we won't use it very much. So now in the picture, you look at that shot and we're on that shot for a very, very, very long time. And he just he just played it right up to the edge. He knows what he can get away with. And if he's given you shots of things that look real, he can insert this shot in and it, it hangs in there. So that's probably one of the scenes I'm, I'm proudest of because it was, but, but, but it happens when you're working with somebody like Jim, he, he kind of wants to go places that he's never been. So you're, you're kind of on that train. And so it, got me to, I think, did it, oh, well, of course, it got me to do some of my finest work. Mm-hmm. And it, it's only recently that I realized that not many people realize that was in front of a painted background. Well, it's good to hear you talk about uh, using kind of old school movie techniques yeah. to get stuff across, like you said, like Wizard of Oz kind of stuff, because yeah. I think that what always takes the foreground on Titanic when people talk about the production of it was how groundbreaking it was technologically. But I also think that when I think of that movie, what I think of are the people's faces and, and you know, Kate Winslet's hand up against the window. And, yeah. like, there's, like, so many iconic images. And that's why, you know, like, when I talk about, like, composition versus lighting, like, I feel like Titanic is a deeply compositionally driven film in, yeah. in a way. Yeah, I, I think it is because the compositions are also so immersive. Mm-hmm. He, uh, again, Jim knows how to put that camera where it's drawing you into the movie, and you you feel so much in that movie, like you are there, you know, not not way off, except except every once in a while he'll go way out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, well, when you're working with somebody like him, yeah. and this is the cinematography podcast, not the directing podcast, so yeah. I don't really want to get too in the weeds about it. But when you're working with somebody like Cameron, the the vibe I've always heard from people who love him and people who hate him is that James Cameron is so good at everything that he could literally fire the boom operator and boom better than that guy could. He could he could fire the the guy doing the you know doing UV uh, layers in the VFX department and he could do it better than them. Yeah, and he'll tell you that too. And, and, <laughs> and it, but he'd be right. I you know he, he's he's it, it, it's formidable. 
So, so for you, uh, as a creative force, as somebody yeah. who's, who's coming to him, and by the time you did Titanic, well, you'd already worked with him on True Lies, obviously, but you'd also worked with John Woo. Yes. You'd worked with, you know, you, you'd, you'd already established quite a healthy filmography by the time you, you came around to working with him. So you're working with somebody who's renowned for really knowing what he wants. Yeah. What's the creative angle for you? Like where, okay. if, if yeah. somebody knows exactly what they want, what are you bringing extra to them and what is in it for you as a creative person? Obviously, there's a paycheck. Right. I, I think as a cinematographer, uh, you, as, as you go through your career or as I went through my career, I'm blessed to work with many, many different types of director. And I, I, I certainly put Jim on the far end of the spectrum in terms of somebody who knows what he wants, knows technologically how to achieve it. So I think to myself... The negative is you're trying to kind of put Jim's head on your shoulders and thinking, well, what does this very demanding mm-hmm. director want? And that's not always the best way to go. But then I'm thinking, what else can I bring to this? So Ilya was actually kind of talking about how like a lot of the people that we bring in here are uh, they're they're seasoned working with like really well known directors. Mm-hmm. But actually, you've worked with some pretty amazing writers. Yeah. Uh, as, as a cinematographer. So, and a lot of them are like writer directors, like the Farrelly brothers and stuff like that. And I guess James Cameron would be Mm -hmm. one of them as, as well. Now, when you're working with someone who's, who's also a writer, there's, I guess, competing schools of thought. Cause like the Coen brothers write their own movies and they edit their own movies or, or Robert Rodriguez writes, shoots and edits. Steven Soderbergh Mm -hmm. does all that as well. But like when you're working with someone who's writing and directing, um, does, do you find that uh, more of the visual uh, aspects of the storytelling end up being kind of handed to you because they're more focused on the writing and the acting and, and that part? Well, uh, that depends on who that writer-director is. But there are, are some writers who do need to be uh, coaxed into the idea that, it's, that their piece of work is, is a – their story is a different story on screen than it is on the script. And they there need to be ways to help let the film breathe uh, mm. cinematically and, and try to open things up and try to... Also, uh, you're thinking as a writer yourself, you're thinking, well, how do we do this without having this cut out of the film later? That that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of the writer-directors that I, I've worked with, some of them are, are actually very, very visual. I just worked with a uh, wonderful director Mark Lawrence, and he 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 did the Miss Congenialities, and he oh, okay. uh, uh, he he came out of being a, a producer and writer on Family Ties. Oh, wow. and he is the loveliest person. And the I thought, oh, this is going to be the last person that I would expect a really neat visual idea will come from. But he had <laughs> lived with this. I mean, only because of how how much he talked about the writing in pre production. And also how much he was forced to constantly rewrite to satisfy studio demands. But when we started to, to shoot, and some of the things that he said in, in prep were, were very, very visual. So some, sometimes this, uh, I guess I've been lucky to work with, with people who aren't really boxed that much into the uh, writing uh, end of things. Well, and one thing also when looking at your filmography, um, you know, a lot a lot of your earlier work are, are more in the genre field, uh, yeah. horror, action, stuff like that. And, and very, gonna, very lots of chop socky movies. And I'm going to get yeah. to Hard Target for <laughs> yeah. sure, because yeah. actually I put out a tweet like, who, who has a good question for Russell Carpenter? Like five people were like, you need to ask him about Hard Target. And I do think John Woo is almost his own genre in, in yes. so many ways. So it would be fascinating to hear you talk about that. But before we even get to that, I want to ask you, what is it like working in so many genres? Because I feel like, you know, once you kind of were established in in the studio world, like suddenly if you look at your filmography, you'll end up you shoot with the Farrelly Brothers. You shot my friend Bob DeRosa's film Killers. You shot Ant-Man, like, you know, a, mm-hmm. a straight up superhero movie. And in fact, actually a really funny off the beaten path superhero movie that still manages to feel every bit as much of a superhero movie as, you know, Iron Man or, you know, any of the batman kind of things out there. So how do you go about kind of jumping in and out of different genres? Because they all do have their own distinctive looks and styles and expectations. And you can either go into those expectations, go against those expectations. Well, uh, I think at the beginning of my career, it was just what came along. I, I mean, it would really, I didn't have a choice. Yeah. And, 
and what came along uh, were, were pretty much for the most part horror movies, chopsaki movies, mm-hmm. which are which are a, a genre of action films. And then more action films came my way. There was a point where I thought I've got to branch out and do something else, and I, I really started to look for. I said romantic comedies. I'd love to do that. And then all of a sudden, I was doing romantic comedies mm-hmm. for for a while. And then it was. I'd like to do low budget independence, and then I, I I brought my special kiss of death to low budget. Oh no! <laughs> don't say that. Independent the, movies. I just I, I just kept of... pick, picking these poor films that just wound up. You know, just they, they didn't have what you call a good box office life by any means. <laughs> and I mean, it just felt like I guess you could just call it either it was either boredom or just wanting to to try to establish myself in a in a different type. Of filmmaking, and I found out that in Hollywood, it's supposed to be a very creative community. But in some way, it's if even if you want to shoot romantic comedies, it's it's hard to turn that around. And, and then the 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 thing that haunts one after Titanic is you can't go to somebody who's got not a lot of money, and <laughs> and convince them that you're not going to blow your whole uh, you know budget because of. Uh, extravagant lighting demands and stuff like that. Because that I mean? was what made the budget for Titanic go up. It was the lighting. Yeah, yeah it was lighting, <laughs> really. really. <laughs> it was two extra tweenies. And, uh, <laughs> if you could have just done it with the, with the tweenies you had, <laughs> yeah, you would have yeah. been fine. Yeah, but but it is, you just, it, you do get pigeonholed a lot. I know that people tell me that happens a lot in commercials, but it still happens in the feature business more than you would think so how do you bust out of it like so if so if you're the titanic guy you're the titanic true lies hard target guy and i'm meeting you to talk about my romantic comedy how do you convince somebody how do you convince me to shoot my romantic comedy uh, outside of begging or something like that you should, <laughs> I I, please I, I mean but really i think it it, it is because you go along I mean, there, there, there's the brand you kind of create by what you do. The, 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 that's important. But this is the brand that you create by who you are on a set. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and people do have to watch out, even as they start out. If their 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 brand is he's the creative but really ornery guy who yells at his crew, that's part of his brand. And yeah. or his or her few brand. The, few of those out there. Y- yeah, but it. Uh, so you have to, but if if you've got a, enough equity built up that somebody who is considered might consider you for a romantic comedy actually gets on the phone and calls people that you work with, and they give the thumbs up, then that will get you in, into something else. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I think people do have to be. I think they have to have to be probably more careful than I was, but uh, <laughs> they, they do indeed have have to watch out about the vibe they create around them. I think that that's well. It's cool. something I, we haven't really ever talked about this on the podcast at all. But I feel like cinematographers get a reputation for being grumpy. Like mm-hmm. it's just known. Yeah. And I, I feel like I've personally been lucky that I haven't really worked with a hardcore grump, but I've worked on sets where they were, were around. What is it that makes them that way? I have my theories, but I'll, 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 I want to, I want to hear well, your, your, sometimes it's success. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't know the more power, you know, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. You know, you just yeah. hear that there are some people who are so good and, and people realize Okay, we're going to put up with this much grumpiness, mm-hmm. and wow! But look at look at what's going to happen. You know, look look at the movie. We're but I feel have. like that theory assumes that grumpiness is an inevitability. That yeah. we're all moving towards an entropy that looks like grumpiness. Yeah, I, I think I think the the model is changing now. That you don't have to be the uh, the grumpy artist. Mm-hmm. I, I think at, at a certain point you get to work with people who are not only terrific at what they do. But they're really nice. Yeah, you know, they're the nicest people ever, and you just go, "Oh, I just want to be on the set working with these people." When that happens, that that can also it takes less stress off of me. And what I had to learn was not to let my stress, if things weren't going fast enough or something wasn't happening, I had to learn not to let that stress roll down in a way that was, you know, because I I said something not nice. Yeah, it. it just to take some pressure off of me, I just had to learn different. You know, I had to retrain myself. Yeah. <laughs> so it was. Uh, 
also because my passion was films and it was so much into, into that, I was so whoosh, focused on that. It took me a while to open up and see people, really see people and realize that I could do just as much by uh, applauding and recognizing when, mm. when people were doing great. And it changed how I felt about going to work. Also, learning not to take the whole thing so seriously. I mean, I love filmmaking, but at a point, I said, I'm not really having that much fun because I'm all stressed out. Yeah, if and, you're screaming at people all day long, yeah. you're a miserable person. Yeah, so I, I, as I went along, I just learned step by step just to have more fun with it. And now it's just lovely to... To, to Is there a camera. key to that, that you can give people, that this would be the biggest gift you could give people, how to do this and 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 keep an even keel and not get stressed out and have fun when you're doing it? Because the higher the level you, you, you the higher you go on this ladder, I feel like the more stress and more pressure falls yeah. on everyone. Yeah, I think, well, one, the, 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 the kind of work on the self is I watch what I'm up to. Mm -hmm. You know, what am I really up to here? Am I up to good or am I just trying to let off steam yeah. that's watching myself but I think that I was so focused on what I wanted to accomplish with imagery or what I wanted something to look like that's all you know and I was uh and I learned oh wait a minute take a breath and look around you know and just see what people are up to I mean the more I could appreciate other people and what they were bringing and and realize hey this person might have had a terrible night at home or something or there's something really colossally not great going on you know health wise or something in their world i don't know if i made room for that i felt like i made space to relax more hmm. about it you know i don't know i, I guess that's all i got <laughs> no that's that's you that's... know and i i done some meditation which which helps at least slow things down enough so that i get a little more visual and that, some of that visualness just comes around a scene. No, that's helpful. Yeah. That's actually yeah. really helpful. And, you know, yeah. kind of mindfulness related things. Yeah. I, I almost feel like uh, there's a podcast called Script Notes that's done by Craig Mazin and John August, and it's all about screenwriting. Oh, wow. And they've brought in, uh, at one point, they brought in a, a therapist mm -hmm. who just kind of talked about, like, how to handle the stress of the business. Yeah. And I sort of feel like from the other side, from the production side, we almost should do that at some point, <laughs> bring in somebody who's a specialist in that because... You know, it is so stressful and the hours are so long and the hours are erratic and weird and you're in different yeah. parts of the world and there are things about it that are wonderful and things about it. You know, it's like you're away from your kids for however long or whatever. And 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 I feel like it's something that um, I, I need to ask more people this, but it's like, how do you keep calm? How do you how do you enjoy it? Uh, that's that's it's a really good question, because I work with people who are under a tremendous stress. And they are the kindest people. Mm -hmm. They never let it flow out. And then there are some people who just seem to, this is how they channel their stress, as it, as it bounces around on targets or whatever, yeah. the set. And that it's a shame because I don't think it's a management style that's really working anymore. No, although I'm not going to say who it was, but I, I once worked with somebody who worked with a big person in the business who was a notorious screamer. Yeah. And this person confirmed for me that the person was a screamer. And I said, did that get this person, did did they get better work out of that? And the person I was working with was like, oh my God, yes, nobody wanted to be yelled at. <laughs> and I, I asked like, did he ever yell at you? And he was like, yeah, yeah, once. And I shut it down. But this is somebody who's like renowned in the business for yeah. yelling at people. Yeah. And uh, I was actually surprised because I thought the answer would be, well, of course not. You know, we all want to show up in the spirit of love and collaboration and we get stressed out and we blow off steam and we forgive each other. But but it will it does take a toll. You know, it does take a toll when you're working long, long days and long nights and you have, you know, the pressure of making the money back or whatever it is. Be, before I go any further down this rabbit hole, though, yeah. I want to I got to talk to you about hard target. Yeah. Yeah. Like, John Woo was somebody who like in the early 90s, yeah. like I'd find, you know, hard boiled or bullet in the head or whatever yes. on VHS. And he was this no just like notorious, crazy auteur. And I don't yeah. throw that word around very much. Yeah. And um, 
And then his American film, his first American film was coming out and Sam Raimi was executive producing it. I remember being super excited to see Hard Target. So what is it like working with somebody who kind of their reputation kind of preceded them beforehand? And again, John Woo is like his own genre. Does does he have his own truck just for doves? There are things we need to know (laughs) about John Woo. Yes, yes, he has. And and, uh, he has a... a a truck full of sheep, but uh, they haven't appeared in any, any movies that he's done. But the dove thing is amazing because I went back and, I, of course, I, I ran off to see these films because I was, uh, I, again, it was Daryl Cass who put me in front of John and I went off to look at these films and I said, oh my God, the way they are blocked and staged is amazing. Really amazing. And the level of mayhem is quantified. By, yeah, it was 10 <laughs> times, you know, it's an explosion of it energy that's going off in all directions. And I was, re- and and when I met John, he was the sweetest guy. I mean, he's really a dear person and he mm-hmm. he's lovely and he cares about other people. And he, I, I mean, it was such a blessing to work with him. And, uh, but what I found was because he, he came to, well, two things happened. Uh, for one thing that John didn't like is when he was in Hong Kong. I mean, he's basically deified in the sense of people know his work and they'll do anything for him, and that's great. And I'm not talking. I'm not talking about this from an ego point of view. It's just that he he would see people would just do the work, but in the United States, what he realized was that the studio was going to have a lot to say, which was not a way he was used to working. And then also, and, I, and this I found out after the, the film was over. In fact, I went in to see him and he was in the middle of editing and and evidently he had to cut out some things because Jean-Claude Van Damme mm-hmm. did not like the, the scene. And he said, he said that, well, one thing I've learned in the United States, he says, is that celebrity is everything. Hmm. And and, and it, if you're a celebrity with star power at, at that time, and Jean Claude Van Damme was, we were uh, at peak Van Damme. Yeah, at that we were. Time, yeah. yeah, and he was not. You know, it was sad to see that he was being arm twisted so much by the studio wanted him to satisfy Jean Claude Van Damme so they could do some more Jean Claude Van Damme movies. You know that that was sad. But what re- what remained. Was of course his. He has just this tremendous passion for making films, mm-hmm. but this tremendous, this different way of staging an action scene, so that as the scene is staged, he he sets a number of cameras around a sequence, so that, as say in opposition to how uh, an American stunt produce, I mean, a scene might be shot. You get a bit here, you get a bit here, and then you get in for here. He puts as many cameras out as he can, and then it's kind of up to the cinematographer to go, oh my God, how do I light this? Because camera B is shooting camera E, and camera G is shooting camera like, J. How many cameras are you talking about? Well, we were, okay, I probably went too high on that. Sometimes I, we might have uh, nine cameras out, and that's not like they're all, I mean, some are little limos and stuff like this, and, 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 and those you hide, you can hide behind scenery and stuff like that, but there was sometimes you're looking, you know, A camera operators looking at yeah. B camera. Op- How he constructs these scenes is kind of like putting together a Swiss watch, you know? I know. And so this happens that triggers this, and, th- and then it goes, and that goes to the, the, the two thirds of a second that I need to that. And that knocks into the three seconds I need here from this angle. And this hit, he's got the whole thing cut in his mind. So it goes off, and it's like this wonderful explosion of energy, and you, and it's just up to, you know, the crew to figure out how they're all going to stay out of the way, and then if, and then it forced me to sometimes come in with a, maybe okay, well maybe it's not a lot of lights, but maybe it's one light that has a dynamic impact that when seen from different angles, it's still doing something to, mm-hmm. you know, and it, and so I, I got to figure that out it also gave me lessons for shooting titanic because we had a lot of cameras out on titanic and i and and you kind of have to think what's the most important shot here what's the base what what are the workhorse shots and what what are the shots that are little tidbits so because sometimes your lighting's not going to be so good for 
certain certain angles. So I learned a lot from him. He was a tremendous uh, teacher just by who he was and how how he worked. But learning learning to think that way in terms of the edit was was really really fun. And then we of course in addition we had what the grips were called the John Woo Choo Choo, which sometimes was three choo choos, which could be three tracks laid. <laughs> yeah. Out, and you'd have different dollies going, not just one dolly behind the other, but you'd have, you know, you, you, you just, and it was all coordinated to the action. It was now, so exciting to do that work. Now, why not do it as coverage, though? And I, I'm, I'm sure that there's a good reason, but why not do those individually? Is it just that it would uh, take too long? I don't know. I think that I think he felt that there was a dynamic energy that. Uh, uh, oh, and also the way he worked. And this was very different than in the United States. In the United States, you have a scene when there are a lot of bullets going off like there were. The director would say what he was going to do, you know, maybe a week before. And then, and then the, the uh, mechanical effects people would go in and lay all these uh, bullet squibs and stuff like this. And there's going to be a this. He would do that on the day. Mm hmm. And and you are only going to get one or two takes. So uh, that was my next question: was yeah. like, how many takes would you do of one of these? Yeah, because his stuff is. I mean, the only way to describe it is balletic. Like it's it it is a a ballet. It's a ballet of violence, but it, it's still there's a you know, and then, and then of course you do all this, and then of course you can release the doves because it's just ballet. You got to have doves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, that was just one of the uh, one of the greatest experiences I had. Well, one of the things though that you're describing, and I think it's interesting to talk about too, is people who shoot a sequence versus people who shoot coverage. And there's nothing wrong with one or the other, but it's like I almost think of a sequence as like animation is is often done in in sequences because they don't have to recreate yeah. the same shot. But when you're working with somebody like John Woo, and I actually feel like James Cameron is yeah. someone who's very similar. Like I I love watching a good James Cameron action sequence because it doesn't feel like okay we're gonna get a wide okay now we're gonna get the tight of this guy in the in the shootout and then this guy. It feels like every shot moves the action forward, and that definitely is something that uh, comes from John that I see in yeah, John Woo's work. I think working on the action scenes that in the last part of Titanic, we had 500 people <laughs> spoke, speaking three or four different languages running up and down the deck of the uh, Titanic as it's sinking into the water at the end Jesus. of the movie. And I had to, you were, I was going to have 10 to 13 cameras out there and placing those cameras and lighting and, and kind of figuring out the sequence. Then I, I had already had the learning to go, okay. Uh, how to prioritize the lighting and, and what I could do and how, where I could get. And uh, that was very good teaching for a, a film like Titanic. What it was going to take uh, maybe four hours to set the scene up. And then to reset the scene, it might take another hour and a half to two, two hours. So, so you weren't going to get that many takes. And so mm -hmm. it, was, it was valuable uh, to... To be able to think that way. Did it shift uh, the way you worked? Did you start working with more cameras after that? And did that like kind of become part of your workflow and your style? On, on action films, I'm always looking. I, I get the kind of what I would call the initial briefing from the director. And he has an, he or she has an idea. And I, I go, okay, I'm definitely going to get those shots. And then I keep looking for places to place other cameras. I try mm. to have... Because sometimes those other cameras, they're like surprise. They, they mm -hmm. yield sometimes a shot you never thought you would you would get. And I, I also even even in non action scenes, I, I I sometimes think that B camera is always going to get the more interesting shot because <laughs> I I have I get gifted operators and and focus pullers who who as they watch a scene, you know the A camera has to do the master shot, but as they watch the scene, they can go. Oh my God! We can cover this whole scene by you know, and they they learn the sequence and they yeah. sometimes can deliver gold. Do you uh, so? Do you tend to when you're working on something big these days, like say Ant Man? How many cameras do you tend to uh, be running at any given time? I would have to say that always depends on what the shot is and the scene. Mm -hmm. There, there sometimes it, it it makes sense to go, wow, we should just this is state of one camera and some then if you're lucky you you can get b camera picking something up in those scenes 
but I don't I don't expand just for the sake of expanding. I expand because there's a potential. You know, not sticking cameras out there because you want to keep your numbers up. It's just like, oh, yeah. is, is there a possibility that this this angle could offer something very, very useful to the editor? Well, I'm just wondering if there was a, a working style shift for you that happened around the time you worked with John Woo or if, or at any other time. No, no, um, I wouldn't say so. I, I'd say the only working style shift that uh, that I've seen over the years has been moving away from using a lot of little lights to try to use just one or two dynamic sources and then just fill in where I have to. Mm -hmm. So there's a simplicity there. And And why the complexity earlier and why the simplicity now? I didn't know how to light. (laughs) 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 You know, also some of the things that I saw, I saw that was really intriguing by people who were using hard light or and I, I and, well it was like no I know what it was was I wanted to grace note everything I call I say grace note means that if I go in with a little bit of light now my favorite light to, for this is like the source four light I don't know if you know it but mm-hmm. it's a it's a wonderful light for just easing a little brush stroke in across a, a background that could be kind of dull and I didn't want to be dull so I was always just hitting you know little things around this set and and now i think i can i can get the same effect with much more much fewer lights that doesn't <laughs> with, make any sense with fewer with, lights. with fewer lights yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so there's a, there's definitely been a simplification there as the technology has changed it's really changed the way i've i've worked and i i'm really enjoying and I've talked to other DPs who are the 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 fact that LED lighting is getting to the place that it is now. Oh and yes. Now we can do some just wonderful things, and now the sensitivity of the cameras is 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 great. And I'm seeing, well, actually, I'm seeing a lot of the most amazing uh, leaps of faith done on Netflix and Amazon. You know the, what those people are doing over in the television world, mm-hmm. and and is amazing and and that's something too that's changed it used to be well films were up here and and people who uh people want to make films would have to use a bolex or or something like that and and now as we see that divide move i i've almost seen the paradigm of well the really great stuff is going to be done on the theatrical screen too holy cow how did he do that how did she do that on uh on stuff i see on cable I know there was a on Netflix on Daredevil scene uh, season one. There was a fight scene that was like, I, I want to. It felt like it was eight minutes without a cut, and it was like a slow dolly in thing. And I was like, this is the ballsiest action scene I've ever seen. This must have taken weeks to choreograph. Like, how the hell did they do it? And I, I love that they're able to take those chances. Uh, that it's becoming so cinematic, and it's just kind of becoming what I rather watch this on a big screen or what I rather watch this at home. Right, and and I'm finding that. Well, I don't know. I, I think when I do look back at the things that really blew me away and made me think, I really want to do this, I saw on a big screen. Mm-hmm. It's just definitely just the impact of being in a theater and, and, and seeing an image that was not only powerful, beautiful, but large enough to get really immersed. Oh, for because sure. There's nothing like that. It's amazing. Well, I think that's an amazing place to uh, to leave off here. Is there any place, uh, obviously, if anyone wants to watch your work, all they have to do is put on any cable channel right now and some of it's on or go see any movie in the theater. But uh, but in, in seriousness, do you have a website or a Twitter feed, uh, Instagram? Well, I, I have a, if you're interested in looking at some of the things I've done, I have a little website. It's Russell Carpenter, one word, my portfolio, one word, dot com. All right, cool. And uh, are you on Twitter or Instagram, any of those places? People can follow me on Instagram at Russell Carpenter ASC. Cool. Well, Russell Carpenter, it's been an unbridled pleasure having you on here. I hope we can bring you back and do a part two one day. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, I think that would be a lot of fun because uh, it's so much fun because I haven't thought about these films in a a while. And and, and it's really going, oh, boy, I learned so much from that that helped Give Cameron's Closet another chance. Okay. (laughs) 
So that was Russell Carpenter. I, I have a, a random story. Can I tell you, Ilya? Yeah, tell me. Well, you were in the room. I'm, I, I guess I'm telling the uh, the people at home, the people in, 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 in podcast land. I don't know. What do we call people? Podcast land, about. yeah. So right after we finished doing the interview, Russell had like a, like a bottle of you know bottled water in front of him. Mm-hmm. And he stood up and uh, accidentally like the microphone cable grabbed his his uh, water and it spilled all over me. And he was, of course, like anyone would be. He was, he was very apologetic. And all I could think was the Titanic guy just soaked me. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty cool. That Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you liked it. Titanic <laughs> guy. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, that's. So, yeah. Russell Carpenter, come on over. We'll do the ice bucket challenge together. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I seriously, uh, un, unparalleled uh, uh, excitement for uh, for, for talking to him. I have a feeling we're not going to see him for a while since he is, I think, in post-production on Avatar 2 and 3 and even something else right now. So, so like when they do that, they don't let you go home. <laughs> yeah, I think pretty much. James it's Cameron like, just keeps everybody in a crate <laughs> locked at, up. at the stage. Well, I mean, that's a lot of work i yeah. mean those are those are huge movies and they go on and on and on and on and on and even if it's local i have to imagine that there's just so yeah. much to do there was an article about like all of the avatar plans and i read it and i was like just reading this makes me tired how much how much planned stuff they have for the the entire avatar universe oh yeah there's already like a disney there's already a disney ride and stuff like at one of the florida theme parks so Nice. Oh, based on Avatar. So, hey, uh, Ben, it's time to pay the bills. All right. Okay, we have to talk about our wonderful sponsor, Aerie. Uh, Aerie has something a lot of people don't know about called the Aerie Academy. You can find this on the... Is it like Hogwarts, but for cameras? It's kind of what it is. What's, uh, what's the Aerie version of Hufflepuff? I don't think they have a sorting hat or anything like okay. that. But basically, yes, once you uh, sign up for this, you get to learn all about all their camera systems. You'll never want to quit it. Oh, that's terrible. Sorry. Terrible. Go on. It, it's a three-day training course. It happens at Airy. I know, at least I know in Burbank, probably at some of their other locations. It covers the Alexa LF, the ASXT, the Mini, and the Amira. Uh, and experienced working professionals will teach this class using real-world production scenarios. At the completion of the class, you'll have deep knowledge of the functionality of the Airy line of cameras in addition to advancing your creative skills. Uh, Each class has a limit of 16 attendees to ensure ample hands-on and a high ratio of time with instructors. Uh, And who they think should attend is cinematographers, camera operators, camera assistants, DITs, rental staff, and production staff. And uh, if you go to... (laughs) And magicians, of course, because if you want to appear like a magician with uh, these these camera systems. Anyway, Larry Fong, he, he checks all those boxes. He is. He, he, he might be. The, he might be one of the only people who've been on this podcast. You can check the magician box. It's but, true. It's true. But I, I assure you, you don't have to be a magician to sign up for this class. Uh, it's not inexpensive, but uh, they give sort of a range here, usually fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred dollars. But when you leave, you will know all about their uh, large format systems, the difference between exposing for a standard dynamic range and high dynamic range, and all kinds of other cool stuff. But Ilya, if I want to do it, where would I go on the internet? This thing that I just learned about the uh, airy.com website does have a section called learn and help. And under that is the training program overview. And that will take you to Eventbrite pages to sign up for this sort of thing. And uh, it uh, appears to be very in depth and you will leave knowing everything you need to know about the airy camera systems. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, it, it, it's totally worth it. All right. So, hey, Ben, I think it's finally short end time. Short end, my favorite time of all times. So my short end is another podcast. Oh God, more podcasts. Podcasts. All you're doing is giving our listeners other podcasts to listen to. Okay, but if you're going to listen to another podcast and you're interested in filmmaking, Ooh. you probably already listened to the Script Notes podcast, which I've probably plugged on here 50 times already. At least. It is, uh, I think, the best screenwriting podcast out there hosted by two illustrious uh screenwriters uh john august and craig mazin craig mazin who most recently chernobyl. made chernobyl so ordinarily also hangover part two and three and three yeah. and identity thief and yeah okay and a few of the scary movie movies oh yeah but chernobyl uh is uh certainly uh his most recent no and and, yeah. and in my opinion my it is certainly my favorite of his work hmm so Craig Mazin did a solo episode of the show, which he never does. Oh. And it's called How to Write a Movie. And I cannot tell, I think, uh, you don't have to be a screenwriter. I think if you're a cinematographer or a director or anything, 
I, I can't recommend it hi- highly enough. So he kind of goes through like Craig uh, Mason and, and John August are always taking a crap on the Sid Field and, and the Robert McKee and the Blake Snyder and all the really they, they take the, a crap on the Save the Cat. They are not a fan oh. of screenwriting gurus because those people are kind of saying like, well, on this page, this needs to happen and on this page that needs to happen, which they do. Uh, I, I think it definitely. Goes, I think it goes deeper than that, and I've read all those books, and I think they're good. But Craig Mazin goes through the why of all of those. Like, mm. why is it that this is happening at this point? And so he kind of goes into like the Hegelian dialectic of of setting up the the theme and the anti theme. Uh, and your character starts embodying the anti theme, and at the end they embody the theme and all the trials that you put them through over the course of uh, the script. And he walks you through his whole process of uh, breaking a feature and he kind of uses um, the Pixar movie Finding Nemo Mm. as an object lesson to kind of say like, you know, here's how this uses theme and it's, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 minutes. It goes pretty deep. I've listened to it. I don't usually listen to podcasts multiple times. I've listened to this episode probably five or six times now because I feel like it's a really good lesson. And again, you know, you go, well, I'm not a screenwriter. I don't care about that. I think if you're a cinematographer and how many cinematographers have talked about this where they're talking about the story and they're talking about the theme and uh, so much of it is like coming up with a visual metaphor or a lensing metaphor or a color metaphor or a movement metaphor that goes together with these ideas. I think if you know how to look for those ideas while while reading a script, it's not it's maybe the first step towards creating the visual version of that for you. So anyway, can't recommend this podcast highly enough. Everyone should go listen to it. It's awesome. Is it under script notes? Yeah, it's on uh, I think it's on John August dot com. If you uh, if you on script notes, it was probably I don't know, as we're recording this, it was probably like five weeks ago. And script notes, you should just subscribe to it anyway, because it's brilliant. But um, because these guys really break down and 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 get granular about the things that make a movie. I found it. It's episode 403 and I am getting it right now. So sounds awesome. I think you'll dig it. And uh, Craig Mazin is just extremely articulate about what he does and how. And and, uh, I think we can all take a lesson from it because, again, he's not like, well, on page 60, blah, blah, blah has to happen. But he he'll say, like, this kind of thing tends to happen around this point in the script. But it's then he goes into why. And to me, it's like understanding the why of it as opposed to the uh, breaking it down. I mean, I think that there's something to understanding basic screenplay structure. Even if you think it's bullshit, it's good to know that you're going to walk into an office and have to talk about it. And again, whether you're a writer or not, you're going to be talking about first act, second act, third act all the goddamn time. That sounds awesome. And uh, I will totally listen to it and uh, hope to have a a a follow-up conversation where i can tell you what i learned yes i bet you'll learn a lot so what is your short end oh man it's it's really interesting working on the technology side of this industry because and i have to be slightly coy i can't go into exactly all the stuff that you're privy to but eventually if you have good relationships with manufacturers people come around and show you new stuff they Mm -hmm. show you new technology they show you new things and they say hey what's your feedback on this or tell me what you think about that or what do you think about this they're not always uh, forthcoming with price points but i will tell you that uh, certain parts of the industry are being majorly changed right now there's a bit of upheaval i'm not saying that like oh the bottom is completely fallen out now and that you know you must rush out and buy one of these things because uh now you can afford it and you couldn't afford it before Mm -hmm. no i think the rules still uh, apply meaning that like the people who really don't have any money are going to be looking for sort of like the cheapest absolute solution which is probably the wrong thing for them and the people who have tons of money will just always buy the most expensive most professional thing and that's what's appropriate for them no i think that there's now a mixing of what's happening especially in lighting where High-end productions are using some relatively inexpensive lights to augment what they're doing because they really do fit the exact niche of what they need. And the same thing that uh, lower-end people are maybe stepping up a little bit to some of these uh, extremely high-performance products that are at a bargain price because now they can afford to get stuff in their hands that will make beautiful, beautiful light and not cost them uh, a mortgage on their home or Mm. not cost them a a used Honda or something like that. So there's this really sort of interesting thing that's happening and it is only going to uh, improve in the next uh, six months. And I don't have particular 
lighting instruments that I should tell that I'm going to tell everyone right now you should go out and buy these but I'd say in the next six months probably by Black Friday or something like that uh, I will probably have a list of like here's a whole bunch of lights under two thousand dollars that will change your life and wow. uh, and that is that is really uh, I think that's you will see big productions adopting some of these you'll see small productions adopting some of these there will still also be the you know the absolute garbage on the low end and the absolute amazing stuff on the high end but there's going to be this middle affordable ground that uh, you can get an incredible output not have to have a generator and with these incredible new sensitive cameras it will revolutionize the way people are working out of the trunk of their car or out of a backpack or you can do cool stuff that you never used to be able to do and huge props out to Panasonic for their forthcoming $4,000 uh, S1H, which is sort of a successor to like their GH line, but it's a full frame sensor. Nice. I'm not sure if I've talked about this before, but no, it, but I was reading about it and I'm, yeah. you, you know, me and my, uh, my dislike of micro four thirds and how I want full frame. Oh, well you're getting it. And the current S1 is amazing. I am. Thank camera. you. Thank you. <laughs> I well, appreciate it. You you are getting full frame coming from uh, Panasonic, and I will tell you that it is mind blowingly awesome. And I won't I won't say anything else, but it is mind blowingly awesome. The new camera, but even the current camera, which is a bargain at just over two thousand dollars, is mind blowingly awesome. Especially like I was shooting stuff on the Fourth of July and cranking up the ISO to like a hundred and eight thousand or something like that, and I could turn a complete like almost moonlit. The moonless night into what looked like daytime and you know noise and grain and stuff like that of course but way way less than you would expect way way less so yeah do you remember like back in the dark ages of like the the aughts like around the time we met the dark ages yes the the, the, the early 2000s yes and it was like uh the cameras were all one third inch ccd or two thirds inch if you were lucky there was no cmos sensor to be found or very Mm -hmm. few and i remember being like why you know like there was the ps technique uh pro adapter that would fake a 35 millimeter uh sensor and and there were like all these things and it was like why doesn't somebody just make a goddamn larger sensor camera and it was just like the economics didn't make sense at the time and then the 5d just blew the lid off of everything it, it wasn't easy it really wasn't easy to to do that and uh the 5d was sort of an accident so yeah. it's it's amazing that uh i mean the gonna... 5d comes along around the same time as the red in the Genesis. And so there were people were experimenting with larger sensor, but I even remember like the Thompson grass Valley Viper two was third, two third yeah. inch CCD and collateral and a bunch of other movies are shot in it. That look frankly, Zodiac was yeah, shot on that look, camera. looks fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, Benjamin and, button, I think was shot on that camera. It was. And I will also say that, you know, granted it's mostly green screen, but if you remember speed racer that the Warshawskis yeah. did, uh, that was all shot on a camera called the F 23. And at the time uh, that beat out every other camera for them, they tested every camera out there. And F 23 was what was, you know, it's just, it's just crazy to think of how far a lot of this stuff has, has come. And even though like, obviously, you know, like you want an Alexa, you want like the best of the best, but there are so many cameras that are affordable, that give you a quality that, frankly, like when I was in film school, uh, we couldn't get on film. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to go off and say, because like really my short end, which didn't really have a, a headline except for that, you know, LEDs are being disruptive and things are changing. Uh, cameras are really, really changing too. So the combination of the lights and the cameras changing together uh, is going to make for even more opportunity, especially for people who are maybe just starting out or working on the low end, but have a few bucks to invest because uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. The new camera stuff that's coming down is absolutely incredible. And I, I, I don't even like want to give spoilers, but it's like, there is so much additional processing that's coming in cameras. There's going to be so much more stuff you're going to be able to do in the near future. It's going to, it's going to blow people away. And still none of them teach you how to work with actors. That's right. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is all, you know, we, we dealt, we went way down into the, the, the tech hole this time and tried not to, uh, huh. It's okay. So, you know, watch this space in several months time. Uh, we'll, Ilya and I will be discussing the things he is kind of enigmatically alluding to today. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you that the future ain't going to be boring. They say, you know, may you live in interesting times. These are interesting times. And if you think it's disruptive right now, eh, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's, it's going to get even more so. I can't wait to ask you off microphone. <laughs> so, Ilya... <laughs> I think that wraps us up, but let's uh, do our thank yous. Yeah, let's thank uh, our producer, Alana Cody. Thank you, Alana, for everything. Uh, let's thank uh, the person who's not listening to this, Kay Zalatracci. Never listens to a single episode, and I think everyone should go to www.musicbykays.com 
and complain to him that he doesn't listen to his own work on the cinematography <laughs> podcast. By the way, uh, side note, right now, Kay's, uh, as of tomorrow, I think, is performing live on stage at a giant Microsoft, uh, like, you know, like one of those giant... Hey, yeah, the, Microsoft expo convention thing something like that he's, he's gonna be, he's like the he composed like the a, music for it and he's gonna be performing on stage so really give him shit right now because he doesn't have the the bandwidth to deal with it they flew him out there first class they're like yeah, yeah he, they're, they're they're taking good no, care of kids yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's doing all right uh we'd also like to thank our editors yes uh abby ben thank you very much and uh, that about wraps it up. Ilya, where can people find you on the internet? You can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras. So you can find me on the Instagrams at Hot Rod Cameras or, you know, Ilya Friedman. Uh, you can also find uh, me. Well, that's basically the only place you can find me. <laughs> uh, you can find me. You know what? Just go to BenRockOnline.com and you can find all of my social media linked right there. You can find my goddamn LinkedIn, for God's sakes. Even. If you are still listening after all these thank yous. Thank you very much. Thank you, our listeners, for listening to us. Please like, share, subscribe. Let people know that we exist so we can do more of this stuff because uh, really it's all about the, the the good vibes and trying to promote us to, to make sure this keeps happening. And we will see you at episode 41. This has been the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.